We're on part 17 of understanding the kingdom. And, you know, I was looking at when I originally started this series, I'm thinking, well, this will help with adding more material into the book that I'm writing. But the truth of the matter is we're going to begin covering so much that the book would have been an encyclopedia set. And so let's just leave it to this. I want, I want to really just take our time to, because we, we, we've done a lot of good preaching and men, women have done a lot of good preaching in the past, but they have never tied it all in with the kingdom of God, past, present, and future. And there is this, there is this, there is this river of truth that begins in Genesis of God's kingdom. And I, I don't know about you, but guys, I'm tired of churchianity. I'm tired of people playing church and I'm tired of being manipulated by religious spirits rather than the spirit of God. And I want to learn how to function properly in the kingdom. And there is, there is such a wealth of information in the word of God when you become kingdom conscious, which is really what Jesus came to bring. He came to bring salvation, but his very first sermon, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We need to realize that Jesus, like regardless of what a lot of people are teaching today, Jesus did not lower the standard. He raised the standard. He went to God's people who were near. Now, all of us Gentiles, we were afar off, the Apostle Paul says, without hope, without God, cut off from the commonwealth of Israel. So we're afar off. We, we had nothing. He went to those that were near and said, you guys need to repent because I'm bringing something greater, established within Israel called the kingdom of God. And that's what we're called into. So Jesus raised the standard, but I also believe he raised the standard for freedom. He raised the standard for us being able to walk in the promise. He raised the standard for blessing. He raised the standard for the level of authority. He raised it all, but because we have watered down the gospel, we have watered down the word, nobody is walking in the level of the kingdom that they should. And I want the kingdom more than anything else. Now we're still on Jericho. As I begin to really dive into Jericho, I found some very, very interesting things. We're about to get Shinari, as they say on Facebook, when I begin to teach on these things. When anything to deal with uh, the Shinar Directive, a lot of people said, oh, it's starting to get Shinari in here. We're getting a little Shinari in some of the things that we're, we're going to cover. Because I always looked at the walls of Jericho, okay, walls came down, no big deal. I'm reading in the Lexham Bible Dictionary, and it's dealing with the manner of destruction. I need to add here that all archaeological digs that have been done have proven what the Word of God said, that the walls fell flat, all except for one little section. One little lady named Rahab, who had the scarlet thread hanging out her window, all the rest of the walls, in fact, it was a double wall. There was an outer wall, and there was an inner wall. They all fell. So here I am reading this out of Lexham, and it says the wall of the final Bronze Age city of Jericho is referred to as a Cyclopean wall. It's architecture style, um, which encapsules the city and its construction dates to the Bronze Age, Bronze Age number three, around 1600 B.C. Well, the first thing that ran flags up for me is the word Cyclopean. Cyclopean is a term that both uh, the late researcher David Flynn, uh, Dr. L.A. Marzulli right now is going all around the world researching the Nephilim and how that in South America there's these, all these ancient Cyclopean walls that were built pre-flood with monolithic stones that weigh hundreds of tons. Hum we, we don't have the technology today to build what they built back then. But what's so interesting, in, instead of being like bricks, that the, the rocks are of all these weird geometric shapes and everything else, but they're put together with such accuracy, no, martyr, no mortar is needed, and you can't even slip a piece of paper between them. They are so well joined together that, that you can't even slip a piece of paper between them. In fact, one engineer told L.A. Marzulli the only way that, something, especially something this massive, 
He said, the only thing I can think of is they had something that was able to molecularly change the structure of the rock, and they fit together with, 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 uh, with, with laser-like accuracy. So it's a mystery. And all of a sudden, this cyclopean word comes up, dealing with the walls of Jericho. And so I said, you know, uh, you know, 1600 B.C. is good, but we need to go back further because its architectural style is antediluvian. It's Nephilim before the flood. And so I look it up on Wikipedia, and it's one of the interesting things it brings up. It says, perhaps the most important discovery was evidence that the earliest wall suggested by an archaeologist named Kenyon to the date of around 8000 B.C. based on radiocarbon dating of the material to 7825 B.C. Now, I don't think it's that old, but what it is, it is prior to the flood. That is so important. Because prior to this, it has pretty well been uh, among biblical scholars that the only, the only um, edifice that survived the flood was the Great Pyramid of Giza. And there's a lot of arguments on who built that. Was it, you know, some say it, it was the Nephilim. Some say it was Enoch. Some say it was God built it. And so there's all this, and what my, my own personal, because some of the technology, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza is centered, dead center. If you take the, the, the center of the pyramid and go straight down, that is to the millimeter, the exact center of the landmass on which it's built on. It is 100% north, south, east, and west. True. This thing was built before the flood, yet it has settled, settled over the centuries, over the millennia, just mere millimeters. And the accuracy of it is like that of the Cyclopean in that there's no martyr required and you can't even hardly slip a piece of paper between these blocks. Uh, but the difference is, instead of all these weird-shaped blocks, it's block blocks. My personal uh, belief is that the, the uh, Great Pyramid was watchers built it compared to their children, the Nephilim built the Cyclopean. But most, most everybody pretty well believes that the only thing that survived of the ancient stuff was the Great Pyramid. But now we've discovered something very important. That Jericho was an ancient citadel of the Nephilim. Can you imagine how occultly charged that ground was? In fact, some of the other wall built that was built on later on, they have discovered part of their practice was they would, they would abort babies as a part of their sacrifice to their gods, and they would encapsulate those babies, and they would put them in the walls to, so that the, the gods, if you would, would strengthen the walls. Everything that is anathema for, as far as us that serve the God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were literally built on the inside of the walls of Jericho. And God has them hit that wall, that, that citadel, first off. And I thought, well, why is that? If that was a citadel of the ancient Nephilim, it would become a magnet, a spiritual magnet for all occultism and the very stronghold that attracted all the giants that filled the promised land. Makes sense, doesn't it? So after they cross the Jordan, God says the first place you're going to attack, before you can drive out the giants, you've got to begin taking down their power source. You've got to take down the spiritual forces that has enabled them to seize the land. I mean, guys, we... There, there, there is so much that, that it compares to spiritual warfare here. It wasn't just the first city when they crossed the Jordan. God brought them to that Pacific place in Jordan, had them cross, and then had them to confront the very power source of everything that was going on in the promised land, contrary to the will of God. And God says, the citadel, 
the stronghold of the Nephilim, this thing that did not collapse with the judgment that I gave with Noah, my judgment of my people taking the promised land is getting ready to tear it down. Now, I don't know about you, but that excites me because there have been a lot of things built in the world today based upon Nephilim doctrine, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, and they have all these places where the, land, where the ley lines converge that are occultic centers of power, that Almighty God is going to anoint His children in this hour to begin breaking the spiritual power of of those things for the sake of the remnant. Oh, I'm preaching now. But God doesn't just stop with, I want you to tear the city down. He anoints Joshua to speak a curse concerning the city. We find this in Joshua 6 and 26. Because I tell you what, one of the things that really makes God mad is for the devil to come back and to rebuild what God had told, tore down, especially when it is a strategic place. That should be a sign for us in our lives. If God ever has worked in your life to where he has destroyed something, where he has broke a bondage of something, where he has set you free of something, don't ever let the devil build it back. That is just a prophetic warning. It says, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that raised us up and built us this city Jericho. So God's getting ready to tear it down. And he says, Woe be unto the man. God's going to deal with the man that tries to build it back. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set the gates of it. And basically what that saying is, if a man is audacious enough to build the foundation, it'll cost his first son's life. If he completes it and hangs the gates, his youngest son will die. How many know that God was saying, listen, I'm tearing something down that survived the flood, and don't anybody ever build it back up? Was this fulfilled? We find it under a specific reign. It was, it was in 1 Kings 16, starting with verse 32. I want you guys to look it up. But let me set the background. It was in a time in, the, in northern Israel, the northern tribes, that there was an evil king and an even worse wife, queen. It was under the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, in which the iniquity force was in ascendancy in the northern tribes. So it was under that spiritual climate in which only the prophets of Baal could sit at the king's table. Oh, I could preach about today how that there are kingmakers in the body of Christ that, that control a lot of the airwaves. And all we have is a lot of men that have so compromised they have become the prophets of Baal sitting at the king's table because it's a place of empowerment. Truth is going out on the airwaves, but it's on podcasts. It's on, you know, we, we, could, we could mention Hagman and Hagman and all these other ones that are men trying to get truth out there when you can't even stand to turn on a lot of Christian television today because what you're hearing are the prophets of Baal who have been set at the king's table and they have been given this script. You preach on this, you don't touch on this, you don't touch on that, you don't preach this, you stay away from this truth. Let me tell you something, for me, this is one of the reasons I'll probably never be on there except for Skywatch TV, is because... You give me a list like that, you've just given me the points to my next sermon if I have half a chance to preach it on the airway, especially on live TV that can't be edited. I mean, that's like sick him to a dog. <laughs> Don't touch on abortion. We're getting ready to hear the historicity of abortion and its occultism on planet Earth. Come on. That's why I'll probably never be on those things like that, but that's okay with me because those things... Can, can, I, can I tell you where we're at right now because of technology? And this shows the awesomeness of God. A lot of what have been the gatekeepers to suppose Christian television, because they have so compromised 
they're getting ready to become obsolete. God is using new paths. And if you notice, their empires are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. A lot of you watch, and all of a sudden, there's a little house on the prairie reruns going on that used to, you know, and, and um, shopping network, all these different crazy things instead of the teaching and preaching of the word because there's so few that can pass the gauntlet and still be able to write out the check. And it's usually the ones the Illuminati have funded. There are some rare exceptions of some real men of God out there that are, that are that built too strongly, that, are, that, have, that have notoriety enough, they've got to let them honor give a reason why not, and they, can't, they haven't come up with a reason yet. Although they're probably still working on it. That's just my take. Okay. We find here in 1 Kings 16, and this is talking about Ahab, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. Uh-oh. Probably even a little bit more than just setting up a Christmas tree, but that's a whole other thing. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So iniquity and the iniquity force is in ascendancy. And whenever it's in ascendancy like it is today, it enables the workers of evil to go back and revisit ancient evils to rebuild them. Selah. Okay. And that day, how the, the, Beth, uh, the Bethelite built Jericho, he laid the foundations whereof in Hebron, his firstborn, and set the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sigub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. So this, this man came in, and when he set the foundation, it cost the life of his firstborn son. When he, but he went ahead and continued because of the iniquity force was, it was compelling him to do it. There's not just an empowering. We need to understand that there's a force today flowing through the UN. There's a force today flowing through the Masonic Lodges. Even those that never really took it seriously, you bowed at a satanic altar, and you went to Lucifer for light, whether you realized it or not. And there now is this force driving you to do things that you don't want to do and this man knew it cost him his firstborn son when he laid that foundation maybe i would have backed off maybe you would have backed off but this thing was so driving him that he didn't care and he knew because of the prophecy that was given by joshua that it would cost his youngest son and he didn't care he rebuilt anyway it shows you the evils of jericho but I'm getting ready to uh, get a little, even a little deeper. Veteran researcher Stephen Quill, I've heard him on many of the shows. He has probably researched the Nephilim more than anybody that I have, have ever heard or read after. And he believes that the, the Nephilim, the original Nephilim, had these sinus cavities that allowed them to release a harmonic resonance that almost created like an anti-gravity field. And you think that's crazy but they're actually doing it in DARPA and other areas they're using harmonics to create like a tractor beam or a levitational force and he believes that many of these stones were able to be set into place not because of, of maybe physical strength but because they were able to use this to basically levitate and set the stones into place so they used harmonics is one of the things that he postulates now none of us can go back in time and, and th this is this is this is things that make you go hmm but at the same time, there, are, there is scientific evidence of its possibility that this is something real that they're working on in many of the laboratories around the world. But when you realize, how did God take down the walls of Jericho? He used the nation of Israel to farm a harmonic weapon. Hey! <laughs> that at the shout of the praise, combined with the sound of the shofar, coming from 365 degrees around the walls of Jericho, 
that which was built by harmonics was tore apart by divine harmonics. Woo-hoo! God's bigger. Yes, He is. But you want to know the true way to pull down a stronghold in your life? It takes the resonance of God's voice flowing through you to speak to the citadel of evil that was built within you to tear it down. You can shout at it all day long, but unless the resonance of God is flowing through it. You see, one of the problems that we have today in the body of Christ, we like fluffy preaching. We like the, the, we, we are in an age of the tickling of the ear that because of grace, and this, this is what confounds me, now we're teaching basically in principle is that The cross changed God. The cross changed sin and sanctified it. So now that a believer is under grace, he can sin all he wants to and he can still make it to heaven. Yet the New Testament says in entirety that without holiness no man will see God and even the apostle Paul of whom they try to say came up with this doctrine says those that continue in sinful behavior shall not go to heaven but find their place in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever so there's this disconnect here but it seems like it's it's almost like spiritual Uh, sales TV, the guy with the greatest promise of how you can get away with anything you want in your flesh, and it can promise you the most angels are going to come to your house if you give a tithe, is the one who gets the biggest ministry. But what we have forgotten is we should only listen to those voices in which the resonance of God is in their voices that they have been touched by God, that they have, they have went on the mountain, that they have met with God, and they have come down with a real message. But what we have today are men that have learned to dig into the lower pits of Sheol and begin to resonate with that because they are false prophets. Oh, but Mike, some of the things they say come to pass. Don't care. Because everybody knows, what's the sign of a false prophet? Well, he says something that doesn't come to pass. Well, imagine that for Isaiah. It says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And 50 years later, people saying, well, Isaiah was a false prophet because I don't see that happen. It didn't happen for a, you know, a long time later. But the Scripture is quite clear. If he comes in, if a dreamer of dreams... Or someone with a prophetic word comes in and everything he says, everything. The brother's got 100% accuracy. But he takes you away from the full counsel of God's word. He's a false prophet. Because God said, I'm testing you. And I'm here to give you notice that this generation has failed. They have gotten an F from God. Because they would rather have signs and wonders and words that tickle the itching ear that is trying to rebuild Jericho in this generation and is costing us our sons and our daughters. Mm. If you can't hear God's voice, God's resonance in the sound of a man or woman's voice teaching the Word of God, don't listen to Him. And better agree with the full counsel of God's Word. The cross did not change God. The cross did not change sin. The cross changes me and sets me free of sin so that my want to goes from sin to righteousness. I want to be holy. I want to know Him more. I want to give Him glory. I want to get into the Word and have Almighty God show me marvelous things. Sometimes it's correction, but every correction God gives us sets us free. All of God's instruction, when God says don't, it's an eternal don't. Why? God is unchangeable. Oh, Oh, 
See, we, we forget that in our theology. God is unchangeable. We're as pliable as Plato. <laughs> He's unchangeable. Aren't you glad? The book of Malachi says, I am the Lord God, I change not. That's why you scuzz buckets are still alive. That's the Mike Lake translation of Malachi, you sons of Jacob, who keep running away from me and running back to Babylon and running back to Egypt. Because it's a little easier on your flesh. The New Testament principle is you crucify the flesh at every turn so that your spirit man can begin ruling and reigning in your life. Oh. So we not only stop with the destruction, we pick back up Joshua chapter 6. Now there's two principles here. Number one, since it's the first city that they had to conquer, how many know the top 10% always goes to God? It's called the tithe. Jericho was God's tithe. He said, it belongs to me. Starting in verse 17, And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. And may I add here, not only did Rahab live, you find out she is in the genealogy of Messiah himself. That, that blew me away the first time I saw that. I mean, no, God said, the, the, the desire that you had to walk with God even though you lived in the citadel of the Nephilim. I got something for you because out of your window you hung a scarlet thread. Let me tell you something. Some of us want a scarlet robe. Some of us want a scarlet ladder. But all it takes is a small thread of the blood of Jesus and hope begins to build and it can last for generations. Oh, boy, it's been a while since I've had to preach on me like this. This is okay. Some of you said, I just have a thread of hope. That's all it takes. Just one scarlet thread. Whew. And she and on all that are with her in her house, because she did hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, if any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, let ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the cursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Now I might add to that, that there is a, within the Torah, there is a process that those things had to be smelted down and cleansed by fire. It had to pass through the fire. But notice it said, it said it's accursed. Now when I looked up the word accursed, as karim in Hebrew, which means a devoted thing, a thing dedicated at the same time it's banned, a thing perforated, having been utterly destroyed. And so God used this one word and said, these things are utterly destroyed for your use, but they're completely dedicated to my use. Now, he didn't do that in any other city in all of the promised land that they went after. They had, there were spoils of plenty to go after. But you have the principle of the tithe, and all these things were demonically charged because of where they were. They possessed occult power. If you don't believe that occult power can be attached to anything, then you've never dealt very much with spiritual warfare, nor have you researched how the Nazis and those within the secret societies scour this planet for ancient relics that are charged with occult power. You have no clue, and you mock things you don't understand. And so God said, don't touch it. This particular area Nothing, because it's ground zero. It was, the, it was the power source. It was the place that irradiated the, the spiritual power that enabled the Nephilim, uh, or the giants, to take those areas. And what's interesting is you find out as you, as you do research, and Stephen Quayle and others have done this research, when Israel drove them out, now there's evidence before the flood of them being in South America, North America, all over the world. There are pyramids in China, guys that very possibly predate the flood. 
China tries to, you know, keep that quiet, but it's there. But in this time period, when you see that Israel was actually successful in driving out the, the children of the Anakim and the Zimzumbim and all the other Eames, <laughs> that they migrated to a place that became known as Great Britain and began to found something called the Druidic religion, which is based in magic and occultism and everything else. Why did they go there? The power source in the promised land was broken, and either they went to where there are many, you know, the stone hinge that you see, that, that is an occultic spot. They have found some stone hinges that the entire stone hinge was maybe several miles in diameter. There's the, the, so stone hinge is actually a little one. So they gravit either they went to and built or gravitated to another ancient place the, that, the, that their descendants prior to the flood had made places of power is where they gravitated to. And there's ley lines. In fact, uh, Chris Pinto has an outstanding video on um, riddles and stone that you can take the original 13 colonies. May, uh, guys, they did this before GPS. They did this before all this stuff. The 13 colonies are built on a ley line that intersects with Stonehenge. Just a little mystery. But getting back to the accursed things. There's one guy. Now they were warned about this before they went in. They were warned about this before God brought down the walls. And it's always easy to remember the guy's name that did this because his name was Achan. And you find out his final lot was being stoned to death. So what, you know, you, you end up aching as you're being stoned to death is the easy way to remember his name because all these other guys in the Old Testament, sometimes they have names this long. His was short and to the point and actually in English revealed his destiny. But we pick up in Joshua 7 and 1, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Kermi, the son of Zabdi, the son of... Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of an accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And so one of the things that happened that even Joshua messed up on, they just took down the biggest citadel in all of the promised land. Now there's this little village, there's this little itty bitty town named Ai. We'll just, you know, round up a couple of guys and go take that over. What's that compared to Jericho? He didn't inquire of the Lord. At the same time, he didn't know that there was a sin in the camp. And guys, this is one of the reasons why God is promoting holiness again in our generation. is because as God begins to build cities of refuge, as he begins to build safe places, we need to understand that the sin of one can cost many their lives because it will create a hole in the hedge of protection. And we jump to verse 19. So they went down there, a bunch of guys got killed, freaked Joshua and them all out, so a little AI chased them off. And God says, you got sin in your camp, so he began to do lots and, and go through family by family to find out where it was. And in verse 19 it says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, unto the Lord the God of Israel, and make confession unto them. Tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed I have sinned against the Lord God, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylonish garment and two hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels of weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they were hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So that which God told him not to touch, he took anyway, even though there were many, 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 many cities. God just took down the biggest one. 
All the rest of them, he could have plundered all the gold. The Bible says you're going to find gold that you've not had to dig. You're going to have houses that you didn't build. You're going to have vineyards that you didn't plant. All this is promised before him. But it wasn't enough. Kind of like somebody that knows the truth of tithing but refuses to tithe. See law. Now that is not a push for people to send their money into this ministry. Guys, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Very few will tell you that if the Holy Spirit tells you, you can take your tithe and take it down to somebody that is in need and give it to them and not just your local church. Now primarily it goes to where you're spiritually fed. But if there's a need... If, there's a, if, there, if there are people that are starving, if, there's, if there is a need before you, you can take your tithe and God says, you know what, you give it unto the Lord. The Bible in the, in the book of Hebrews, although people will tell you the tithe is a law, it existed well before Moses. The writer of Hebrews says that when we tithe that Jesus receives. It sounds to me like it's kind of New Testament too, just by that. Um, people just don't want to give God what belongs to God. Well, then you're cursed with a curse, according to Malachi. And even those who preach against generational curses will still tell you to your face if you don't tithe, you're cursed. So there is this paradox in the kingdom. But when you understand that those things had never went through the purification process, they were still demonically charged with power. Many of that, of that silver and that gold could have been used. It was either in the treasury of a pagan god or was used in the worship of demons. And so him just taking it and burying it underground in his tent. So now you have this demonic energy radiating out into the people of God, which may have caused Joshua not the inquire of the Lord before going down to Ai. You see, one of the, one of the, the tasks that a pastor has, and I, guys, I pray for pastors. God bless them. Uh, they, they have found out sheep bite. Of course, I've also found out a lot of goats try to pretend, pretend to be sheep. And the, and the easiest way to tell is, is a sheep goes, bah, and the goats go, nah. So when you try to preach the word and they're going, nah, they're a goat. And to quote John Hagee, the only thing that you can do to bless the body of Christ with a goat is to have a barbecue. I'll just let him handle the ramifications of that. He's the one that preached it. I'm just passing on the word. But either the bleeding of the sheep or the neighing and and and. and Propensity to create chaos of the goats are eating pastors alive. And now you have sin going on in the camp that is causing all this spiritual static, if you will, so the pastor is not praying the way he should because he's too busy wiping noses and probably other places within the body of Christ instead of them doing it for themselves. So he doesn't have time to pray. He doesn't have time to get in the Word the way he needs to get. And then the saints gripe at him that he's not Mr. Superpower to be able to do all that he needs to do when he's running himself to death because they won't grow up. And then believers run into AI after AI after AI after AI. When very likely, the reason the pastor is having problems is because of the gold and silver they have hidden underneath their own tents. Whew. This stuff's getting deep, isn't it? Now we can ask, could Nacon have asked forgiveness? There were wives that didn't have husbands because of what he had done. There were children that no longer had fathers because of what he had done. You see, eventually the Word of God says that your sin will find you out. 
and his sin found him out and it cost him the lo- his life, his wife's life, their children's life. And I believe if I remember the story correctly, they even killed his livestock just to make a point. Because you desired earthly things, all the earthly things you had perished with you in the judgment of God. I don't know about you, but a Babylonian, and it could have been a Babylonian knockoff. It was Babylonian-ish, but it wasn't Babylonian. China had already been doing its knockoffs, I guess, even way back then. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, but it may have been a knockoff, but it was enough that it, was, it appeared to be costly to him. Now, when I look at Jericho, it is a perfect type and shadow of a spiritual stronghold in spiritual warfare. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now let me tell you something. You cannot sit there and twiddle your thumbs and have other people pull down your strongholds. I don't care how anointed their deliverance ministry is. What happens in a lot of deliverance ministry is the demons that are living outside the stronghold can be cast out. But the ones living inside the stronghold, someone externally cannot come in and cast it out. Paul was very specific. You have been given power through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Nobody can pull down your imagination but you. Nobody can cast down vain imaginations but you. It is an internal thing. Now, people can come into prayer with you. They can agree with you. But you've got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to do the task. We need to understand, number one, every single stronghold built within your soul, its very foundations are demonic in nature, just like Jericho. You see, the Nephilim prior to the flood, the book of Enoch tells us, becomes the demons that we wrestle with now. They are disembodied spirits that cannot manifest their will in the earth unless they have a body to work through. Those are not angels. Angels have their own bodies, and their bodies work very well. They just simply are allowed to be manifested in the first heaven with a physical body. That's why, the, you know, even Peter tells us to treat strangers nicely because we could be in entertaining angels unaware. He didn't say that the angels came and inhabited somebody and we're treating a stranger that happens to have an angel. We have angels show up all throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament. They, didn't, they were not required to possess somebody to manifest. Demons are. It's because they're the ancient spirits of the Nephilim that were neither of earth, neither of heaven. So there was no judgment. That's why even when they confronted Jesus said, are you come to torment us before the time? They know their time's running out. So every, the foundation of every single stronghold in our life is demonic in nature. A a demon either inspired somebody to cause trauma in your life, to cause a wound in your life, or to teach you lies. For some people, the lie is, you're not worth anything. That is counter to the gospel. The gospel is Jesus so loved, Almighty God so loved you, that He came as Jesus to die for you. And that because he came and loved me and counted my worth, that worth is manifested by the price he paid at the cross. Therefore, we do have intrinsic worth. Guys, if, you know, if, you, if you've ever been poor, you know, there's poor, then there's poor, okay? Poe is you take things down to the, to the uh, pawn shop that you never intend on ever getting back again because you already know, but when you're getting the money, you're too poor to ever get it back, Okay? So a lot of times you think takes things that are junk down to the pawn store that you're never going to want back. But the things that are priceless in your life, if you're ever to a position where you have to do that, you always try to get it back. And when you get it back, you walk in with a ticket, you walk in with a payment, and you're redeeming something that was precious to you. 
God does not redeem junk. He redeems precious. That's why we're redeemed, that we were bought with a price. Okay? So we have had these, these, these demonic forces lie to us, wound us, use other people that are nothing more than puppets to reestablish. You see, wounded people wound people. Constantly. It's usually those that have been sexually abused that sexually abused, they have a spiritually transmitted disease. Those that have been wounded verbally in many different ways wound verbally all those around them. Because you're passing on this spiritual virus that's demonically charged that begins to build foundations on inside of somebody. That as it begins to build up, because they build it up just like a foundation. You'll, and what, what's interesting is if you have ever had anybody that was wounded speci specifically sexually, there, there's like this spiritual red flag that all these predators will hunt them down. You can put them in, in, a, in, a, in a group of 10,000 people. And if there's a sexual predator there, they will find them. Because it's spirit to spirit and so the next spirit is coming along to build on the foundation of another so why have people said this over and over again in my life if i'm recreated in christ jesus unto good works and i'm precious to god why is it that ever there was this long stream of family and friends and even people that we don't know that we wouldn't know from anybody come up to us and deposit this junk in our lives is because the demons in them were coming up with another brick to put on the foundation that was originally established in your life by a demonic force. Just like Jericho. True strongholds attract the giants in your life to devour the promise of God in your life. The giants were devouring the blessings of God that were in the promised land. They came and they had to be driven out. But, the, but before they could be driven out, that power source that attracted them and empowered them had to be destroyed. Every single one of us have the sin that so easily besets us. And we also have the stronghold that actually empowers everything the devil wants to use in your life. And what the devil will try to do is he'll, he'll try to get us to attack his back shed and get you to where you're, you, are, you have OCD regarding that little back shed that has nothing more than a, a spiritual lawnmower of the devil in it while you're, while you're walking right past the castle, the citadel that he has built, because if he can't get you, he'll get you distracted on the little things rather than the big things. And the whole time, if the Holy Spirit's working in your life, he brings you, and he'll, he'll, he will have you wander, and you come right back to the front gate of that citadel and said, take it down. But I really want to take down that tool shed over there. Forget about the tool shed. It will fall when these walls fall. And in this generation, guys, I think what we're, what we're getting ready to happen now, I, I have said for almost a decade now, I think, Mary, there's two ways of purification. You can either embrace the fire of the Holy Spirit and be purified, or you'll embrace the fire of persecution and come out through fire. There are a lot of people today that have refused to deal with the strongholds in their life, and they're about ready to be touched by the fire of persecution. My word to you is, don't do that. <laughs> Embrace the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. Allow God to empower you to attack that stronghold. You've got to mark it and say, you're coming down in the name of Jesus and begin seeking the face of God. Now, God will bring people with tools and ideas and different things as well as an anointing to do it, but you're the one who has got to say, won't you guys stand behind me and as a force, we're going into this. But, the whole, but what everybody does in deliverance ministry is they want to sit there and go, all right, fix me. You're never going to get free. All you're going to do is deal with the stragglers. You're never going to deal with the stronghold. You've got to attack the stronghold. And there is always a specific 
truth, a specific instruction to deal with every stronghold. And it is as unique as the foundation that built it. Okay, moving on. A lot of people find themselves identifying more with the stronghold than they do with God. And so the stronghold becomes what they trust in. How many people have pastors dealt with that never got healing because the healing gave them excuse for their honoriness? Gave them the, the excuse. The woundedness of my past gives me the excuse to act like the back end of Balaam's donkey now and still and, and have an excuse. Because once you, deal with, once you deal with the stronghold, you can no longer act like that. How many people have functioned under a Jezebel spirit and they refuse to give up that Jezebel spirit? We were at a conference one time, and, and in a conference of ministers dealing with DID, and they had someone get up to lecture that was, had a back part that was a witch and said, I can't give up the witchcraft. I won't be safe. Then you're trusting in the walls of Jericho. We have got to, our hope, our trust has to be in the shed blood of Jesus the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Word of God. If we haven't realized it or not, we're staking our eternity on it. The life that we live now is but a blip in the radar of eternity. It's amazing to me that we will trust our eternity, which is forever and ever 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 and ever, and that's just the first day, Okay? on the truth of this word, but we won't let it apply to our here and now. Let me tell you something. If you're trusting in your forever, you better start trusting in the here and now and implementing it now. I don't need a stronghold because the name of the Lord is a high tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe. Many experience defeat after the strongholds broke down. You know why? They pulled an Aiken. I want it all broke down, and we're, we're just going to give it to God, except for this little bit of gold, this little bit of silver, gave me excuses for when I want to get in the flesh, and this Babylonian garment. I, I, guys, it's amazing to me. It's a garment. It's something that you put on. Now, what's the believer told to do? You take off your filthy Babylonian, Egyptian garments, the works of the flesh. You put off the old man, and you've got to put on the new. The body of Christ has not realized that the armor, realized that the armor of God will only work if you first put on Christ. Because it will, it, it will repel against the old man. It'll jump off of you. You try to put on the breastplate of righteousness and you're sinning and saying that you can sin because of grace, that righteous breast will jump off of you and it has the ability to because the only thing that holds it to your body is truth and you're not walking in truth. Oh, mercy. When God tears something down in your life, even the things that you may have trusted in at the, because there's, there's, this, there's this dichotomy it's destroying your life, but it also gives you an excuse for the things you'd like to do anyway. When God tears it down, you've got to walk away from it all, and you've got to leave the excuses behind. You've got you to be dead to that thing so that you can be alive unto Christ. And too many today that God has moved and done miraculous deliverance are walking in defeat today because they're dressed in a Babylonian garment and the gold and the silver of Jericho is clanking in their pockets. Guys, it's a powerful thing because it is the stronghold, it is the epicenter for everything the devil's done in your life. Once it's brought down, 
Don't disgrace the work of Christ in your life by taking something with you or going back later on and longing to rebuild it. It was a, it's a costly thing. Anybody that's ever really faced their stronghold, for a lot of us, that stronghold was our identity. It defined us. Oh. God says, that's got to die. That's got to die. You are now defined by who you are in Christ and who you are in a completely different kingdom that, it, that is in the earth to destroy the old things that you used to identify with. Oh, is somebody getting happy? So your task, what you've got to do when you find a stronghold in your life, you've got to mark it for destruction. And then you stay before God until you have the instructions on how to take it down. God will bring men and women of God your way. He'll bring the right message your way. He'll cause a preacher to chase a wild rabbit. Mary and I, we're getting feedback from people with our podcast. And sometimes when we think we're going on on rants, even on the podcast, because we enter into a discussion, we have had people write back to us and said, the questions that I had this week, the piece of the puzzle that I needed was in that podcast. Because for a lot of people, the podcast and these are the only pastors that they have. They're the remnant that, that can't be a part of Babylon calling itself Christianity. And so God gives them a piece of the puzzle. The next week they'll get another piece. The next week they'll, 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 be, they'll felt led by the Holy Spirit to buy a book and there will be another piece. And once you get the pieces of the puzzle together, then God will give you the marching orders to take it down. Because there were specific marching orders and there was a specific process that they had to do to bring down Jericho. It will be that way with the strongholds in your life. But once you bring it down, make sure that it is destroyed, never to be built back, be built back again. And make sure you plant a flag of God's truth there, that only God's truth and his kingdom will reign and nothing will ever be able to be built back by the enemy. Father, we thank you. We, we've covered a, a whole lot of stuff in this teaching today. Father, I ask for an anointing of the Holy Spirit for us to be able to retain that which we have heard but, Father, we need to go beyond retaining. Father, I ask that you would loosen anointing for its implementation in our lives. Father, this is the year to get free. This is the year to see Babylon destroyed. This is the year to see every stronghold broken down. This is the year that the citadels of the Nephilim within must be eradicated out of the remnant. And Father, I call for the fire of God and the anointing of God and the instruction of God and your very resonance to begin flowing through your people to destroy the works of the enemy both within and without. And Father, we claim it this morning. We claim it and we come into agreement concerning this prayer in Jesus' name.